can get the formal introduction real quick and we can get started. But yeah, once again, great to have Catherine here. Um, and thanks everyone for coming. Uh, this is the third and final lecture of the 2024 MSCDP Conversations with Practitioners Lecture Series. So as you all know and have probably heard at this point, this series is designed to introduce students to practitioners who are working with computation in various media and subject matters at a wide variety of scales. We began with Dare Brawley this year, and then we had Robert Gerard Pietrusco, and finally we'll be closing with Catherine Griffiths. Um, and as always, I'll briefly introduce. Um, so Catherine Griffiths is an artist, designer, and researcher currently based between Detroit and London. Currently based, now New York. <laughs> By creating simulations, film installations, and critical software pieces, her creative research practice attempts to make palpable, invisible computational forces that shape power and structure social systems. Her current research investigates the relationship between the ethics of machine learning, learning, labor relations, and the future of work through the lens of worker activity recognition algorithms. Her work is driven by how the spatial, sensorial, and conceptual can produce new vocabularies in thinking and feeling to make the objects of politics felt. Her research has been exhibited in Neuron Simulated Intelligences at the Centre Pompidou in Paris and Gaidai Games 1 at Gaidai University in Tokyo. Recent publications include the Journal of Digital Culture and Society and Perspectives Journal of the Bartlett School of Architecture. She received her PhD in Interdisciplinary Media Arts and Practice from the University of Southern California, her Master of Architecture and Architectural Design from the Bartlett University College London, and her Bachelor of Arts in Fine Art from Camberwell College, University of the Arts London. So now you have a good sense of her bio coming in to take her course as well. She previously taught architectural design and digital studies at the University of Michigan and will be joining at the GSAP as a first full-time faculty in computational design practices this fall. Um, those interested in our work today may be interested in her computational electives, Seeing with Algorithms, that is offered next semester. Um, as always, we'll have a Q&A after the lecture. Please, please prepare your questions in advance of that, and I'll walk around with mics. Um, so great to welcome Catherine, and I'll hand it over to her now. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. Um, so yeah, thank you for the invitation to share my work with you. So I would, I would describe my work as critical computational design, um, and I tend to focus on what I'm calling, we're calling politics of machine learning in society, and the development of sort of custom or critical software pieces for the visualization of those ideas. Oh yeah. Moving. Um, so initially, I want, would like to show you some work um, that plots a kind of trajectory from the ideas that I've been working on and sort of design tactics that I'm using. Um, some of these ideas come from my PhD work that I completed three years ago and, and point towards a kind of broader project um, that I've been calling counter-algorithms. So I started thinking about the problem of interpretability in quotations, that's how it's defined, and also the problem of explainability that's come out of the machine learning field. And my desire to sort of frame that um, as not only a technical issue, but also a more entangled socio-technical or socio-political dilemma. And therefore, using that framing, it becomes as much a question for the arts and the humanities to grapple with this um, and to contribute to, as it does for computer scientists to sort of so-called solve it. Um, and so it was, it was during my PhD work that I transitioned from a sort of more um, data visualization type work to what I came to propose as algorithmic visualization, which is focusing on visualizing computation in real time, thinking about structure and process and what kind of meaning we can gain from looking at those. So what you're seeing here is a project titled Visualizing Algorithms. It's part one of a bigger project. Uh, so it's an interactive software piece developed in the Unity game engine. And it visualizes a, maybe one of the most simple machine learning algorithms there is, a decision tree, um, that's just used to make classifications. And those classifications become decisions. And in this case, I looked at um, a data set and algorithm that make decisions about who has access to finance and who has access to housing. 
So very much a kind of predictive decision-making system that has social consequences. So in making this piece, I was interested in opening up what we might call predictive decision-making systems and understanding them kind of spatially at first, like where are decisions made, um, where an audience or a user can kind of look at, trace individual decision points as they get passed by this network. Um, these points, each point is actually a person from the data set. Um, and thinking about questions like whether this approach to software design could support a kind of re-engagement with autonomous decision making in, in, a, in a context where we're maybe at risk of losing, losing um, our connection to decision making, especially when it comes to things like finance system or um, so, so access to housing. So another piece um, called Evolving, it's another custom software, this time from um, processing. Um, and it's built to explore also quite a simple learning algorithm called the genetic algorithm. And in this case, the visualization is very much thinking about slow computation, sort of slowing down the process um, to meet, let's say, the human scale of perception and understanding of a somewhat complicated and technical process like this. Um, thinking about how knowledge you can talk about how knowledge emerges through computation today. Um, and so taking that from being something very technical and obfuscated and abstract to something that is perhaps more accessible to a non-technical audience. I'm interested in these terms like slow computation, slow AI. Um, and, and, and in that, visual, using visualization um, to not only get at like a visualization of linear technical explanations about like how an algorithm works, but also using visualization to try and layer in more social and ethical and political um, entanglement. Um, and so with machine learning, I'm always looking at these systems that operate in more socially sensitive domains and, and how that can not only entail a loss of transparency in automated decision making, but consequently, a sort of dissolution of accountability for those. So another piece, um, this is a very slow piece. It has many agents crawling across and repatterning this satellite image. I hope you can see it, but it sort of unfolds over a longer period of time. Um, and the work began with a, what, what, what's called a critical code studies approach. So critical code studies, or CCS, it's a method that interestingly originally came from the field of literature. And people in literature, researchers who started to consider source code from the perspective of that, um, you know, so much of the world now is maybe defined and intersected by some kind of source code, some kind of software. They started to see source code as being potentially important text. They might even go as far as to say works of literature. Um, and therefore, are they, the question is, are they worthy of a sort of humanistic analysis and interpretation in the same way that other texts are? Um, so it's a, it's a kind of technique that came from, from the field um, that I was interested in. And so I've also engaged with that tactic, um, performing what you might call a more close reading of source code. In my case, I've been interested in computer vision algorithms. And in this case, it's applied to um, a, a site, a satellite imagery. It's a, it's a site in the Amazon rainforest called the, the Meeting of the Waters, um, which is kind of relevant. Um, so much of my practice is trying to look at computer vision systems as like sites to investigate. Um, and which we can maybe intersect the social and, and the computational and the political. Um, so trying to couple the, this computational design with critical code studies, or sometimes it gets called critical algorithm, critical AI studies. Um, and for me, this entails recognizing 
an algorithm as constructing an argument sometimes, um, that it has a particular viewpoint. And that might be to achieve not only an extrinsic text, but potentially an ideological operation. So then the visualization of an algorithm, the design of interface, software development, all these things come together to um, become a medium for exploring this type of socio-technical investigation, um, this kind of visual exploration. And so in this piece, visual, visualizing algorithms, second part, and it was shown in, it was, it was actually made for an exhibition um, at the Centre Pompidou about the role that the arts have played in the development of AI. Um, so as an exhibition piece, I was interested in experimenting a bit more with the representational style of the piece to appeal, to attempt to appeal to the sensual. So in the same way that maybe Eil Weitzman from Forensic Architecture talks about um, the space of aesthetics as a place of investigation, how do we like render sensible uh, certain processes? I was I was thinking about this as well. So likewise, I'm interested in how to engage the human gaze in this maybe slow computation, um, in this case of an algorithmic process that's making predictions in real time, but how an, maybe inviting an audience to try to spend time in front of it, sort of contemplate it with the same eye that one might have when one contemplates a museum, engage that kind of different Space, so con contemplation. So I've loosely been trying to put together a research framework for my uh, for my work that comprises these three tactics. Um, so what I've been calling reflexive software. For me, this was in contrast to traditional software development, where one's producing tools to perform functional tasks. Maybe reflexive software development is aimed at, at um, critically reflecting on its own processes and code as one's developing. The idea of a sort of visually unfolding an algorithm into its, in, into its social implications. And then counter algorithms. This has a quality of being more of a design proposition. Um, how can we build like counter arguments? software design. Um, it includes um, a project that I, that I developed that's called the Unmodeled, um, which is thinking about how particular human values and perspectives might be encoded into algorithms, but are often missing or unmodeled. Um, and a lot of this work involves creating counter data sets. So counter data sets is a, is a concept that comes from the work of Yanni Lukisas, who's a critical data studies scholar at, at Georgia Tech. And then situatedness, for me, entails embedding computational objects within specific geographical, cultural, social, or political contexts from which they can't be meaningfully extracted. So it counters a form of context agnosticism this sort of neutrality or disinterest that computation has historically taken and re-engages ideas about locality, perhaps, very much drawing on the work of Donna Haraway and, and her work on situated knowledges. And then another framing uh, that I want to loop in is just to point to an interest that I have um, in the current policy framing around AI and data and now how that is could inform some of this work. So for me, my research often flows between um, analyzing what the sociologist Notche Mars calls the testing grounds of technology. Um, and in my work, they often involve studying specifically prototypes and data sets, um, and then connecting those to ideas circulating around maybe some of the legal or the ethical or the policy frameworks we might, we might start calling like a post-AI rights, human rights lens. Um, so this document here that I've got up uh, came out in uh, just less than two years ago. Um, 
and it's the, coming from the US White House, and it presents their initial thinking around what an initial AI Bill of Rights might look like. Um, and it's, it's perhaps one of the documents that have begun to centralize these terms like responsible AI or trustworthy AI, what that might start to look like. And then a more recent one, less than a year ago, this sort of update came out um, to try to speed up the development of some of this thinking and where the government might go in making certain policy commitments. Um, and so in following this work, what I'm interested in is that this line of inquiry into software machine learning algorithms, perhaps it could be in parts aligned with a, a more international um, And I also think what's interesting about it is these documents start to show that this term, the socio-technical, is starting to be centralized in some of this thinking as a sort of more foundational approach to the development of AI. And then I just wanted to point to this, that I've been working on this over the summer. It's a, it was a research um, grant that I worked on with a team from the University of Bournemouth in the UK. And so in the UK context of the policy framing for AI, this is one of the ways that they're interested in what the arts and designers and humanists have to say about the development of a kind of responsible AI framework. Okay, so in the sort of second part of this presentation, I want to share three um, current and very much ongoing projects that I'm working on. And there, they also show three domains where labor, la the, uh, the politics of labor meets AI and vision systems. And they also show um, three different types of like space, like public space, domestic space and the workplace. So this project, um, Labor Domains and Labor Optics, looks at machine learning technology and its role in the futures of work discourse. And it specifically pertains to the built environment and the consequent um, shifts in labor politics that might bring in. And I became interested in um, looking at what's being called human activity recognition algorithms. Um, so you might be much more familiar with object recognition, right? So human recognition um, is a bit more of an advanced set of data and models. Um, and they use the micro surveillance of the human body to predict movements, behaviors, and ultimately higher, higher level activities. And so when you put these algorithms into a work context, this becomes a form of worker activity recognition. And it's speculated to be potentially a big part of how workplaces are managed, and how people are managed um, in the not too distant future. So I became interested in these um, human activity recognition algorithms. Um, so the way that they um, kind of engender the human body. Um, and something that, I think going back to Noche Mars, the reference to Noche Mars and how she advocates to study the testing grounds of technology, this idea of before technology has fully come into its sort of application and acceptance, but where things are being prototyped and tested and configured. Um, Noche Mars says that often we think of these technologies as the things that are being tested, and actually it's we, we are being tested. She says we are being tested to determine how far we'll go, what will we accept into our lives, what might we resist, what might we outright reject. Um, so something I found interesting about worker, worker activity recognition um, is that one of the testing grounds for them right now is the built environment, specifically construction sites. Um, 
And they, this appears to be one of the testing grounds for a potential autonomous man, worker management. Um, so I came across this research paper project it was published in Automation and Construction a few years ago. Um, and it, it prototyped a particular way of doing this, um, leading to the prospect of what we might call gate surveillance as a new form of biometric in the workplace. Um, and I'm interested in the, not just studying the system, but studying it simultaneously by thinking about the concurrent impact it might have on human rights and labor rights in the workplace. Um, so this system, it's um, not only trying to track workers and what they're doing, but it's also evaluating those activities in terms of productivity based on this kind of full body surveillance. And so in analyzing this, I'm interested in contesting these classifications of productivity, how they're modeled. Is, I know you might not all be able to see it, but the line that's highlighted in green, so this is the uh, activity taxonomy um, that the prototype is working with. And there's all the kind of things you might imagine, measuring activities, moving activities, uh, like uh, welding is in there, things like that. But the one that I've highlighted in green is a class of activities called resting. And in that class, the, the, the algorithm is able to recognize you standing still, standing and drinking water, or standing and wiping perspiration. And of course, it um, evaluates these things as being non-productive. So in, I should say, this software um, is open source. It was available online. The data sets were available to download. Um, the, 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 um, the published paper is behind a firewall. Um, but the data sets and the main part of the project. So in performing what you might say is a more critical code approach to this kind of software and its data sets, and trying to reinterpret these functions and meaning from a more humanistic perspective of labor rights and relations and the futures of work in that, from that perspective. I developed this series of visual simulations and interfaces that try to express some of these concepts. So for me, the work questions the assumed political neutrality and promise of concepts such as Industry 4.0 pointing to a more structural dynamic in which technological innovation appears to, you could say, roboticize the worker's body rather than liberating the worker's body, the arduousness of work. Um, there's the prospect of autonomous management systems that precipitate the possibility of autonomous work uh, labor relations. So what is the landscape for labor rights and their negotiations 4.0 to meet this landscape of machine learning in the future of the workplace. And um, going back to this, I, this part of this framework of reflexive software methodology, I was inter interested to build this alternative software interface in which a user could vi visualize but also point to contestations of these logic between different industries and different workers across geographic cultural level. So this scene in the software, there's, there's four scenes, um, confronts some of the disconnects between technical agnosticism um, and precision versus the meaning that is imbued in a worker working in one of these social Then this other scene, I was interested to find a way to think about the vision, to visualize this idea of the dissolution of accountability in generative models, the way that when we use generative systems, especially in a context like the workplace uh, and worker rights, there's a loss of accountability and decision. Particularly interesting how that will play out in these new AI management systems. Um, so it's a scene that I'm, I'm also trying to question this idea of explainable AI that's come out of computer science as a sort of solution to this problem. Um, I think it points to 
the way that machine learning in the workplace could covertly reformulate worker rights without oversight and without agreement, maybe following on from the thinking of A. Anish, who talks about an algocracy, algocracy um, and the way that algorithms in that sense, the, specifically the design of algorithms, can covertly reformulate things that we have. So what you're looking at is, sorry, what you're looking at is a, just a visualization of the whole network in this sense. Um, it's actually operating in real time over an in, the input video that you saw in the previous slide. Um, and for me, it, I'm thinking about the impossibility of explaining decision making if we understand those decisions to be socio-technical, not just. So this would be a traditional explainability Um, and then this other kind of sub-project of this that I've been calling the unmodeled um, shows a counter data set that I built as a design proposition, which tries to reimagine an alternative model, um, alternative data pr parameters, um, which potentially could be uh, modeled or prioritized, and they're often based around worker rights and well-being. And some of this work was published recently in this article, Unmodeled Infrastructure in, um, in the Gradient Journal. So a second project, um, which is also in its early stages, and this moves from the workplace to uh, the intimacy of the home. This piece thinks about the potential role for AI in a suburban home. So reflecting on ideas that are coming out of Zen of feminism and the prospects of AI on what has historically at least been considered gendered labor, labors of care, reproductive labor, including its liberatory potential. And it's a project that it's more personally situated kind of takes on a bit more of a narrative form in which I filmed my own mother in her home and I sort of reenact her domestic tasks, her tasks in, to build a motion data set. And I'm also taking cues from other feminist portrayals of space that I've been interested in, especially domestic space. So this um, is a reference to the, art, the filmmaker artist and filmmaker called Chantal Ackerman in her last film before she died called No Home Movie. It was also shot in her mother's apartment. Um, and I'm interested in representationally also combining a sort of cinematic portrayal of space borrowed from sort of social documentary projects like this with various forms of algorithmic visualization. Another reference is the work of Caroline Walker. She's a painter whose work focuses on also on the sort of gaze of women's work, domestic labor, um, through a series of paintings. She also has a project which features her own mother, which I was interested in. But my point of departure um, is this reenactment of various tasks of domestic labor in which I use motion capture technology to develop these algorithmic re renditions of different, of different types of labor. And the output of this process is the construction of this data set of 3D animated motions or activities, much like a library of digital assets or models, or also much like some of the data sets that activity recognition algorithms are trained on, similar to the previous project. And so I'm imagining ways that we might re-politicize politicize some of these repositories of 3D assets and data sets that are typically very apolitical, asocial. Um, also thinking about the near future of the home, the space that produces data sets that are used to train domestic robots and other learning algorithms, and the ways these 
objects are set to enter intimate spaces and care settings, especially those in the context of um, unpaid work and, and low paid. And so in developing this um, techno-materialist exploration of gendered labor in a suburban domestic environment, I'm interested in what happens when AI penetrates the home more, substan more substantially. Um, I'm interested in the privacy of a home as a domain that is targeted by this looming vectorization of the body and domestic space. Um, I'm thinking about the work of Meredith Whitaker, especially in her, her piece, Prison Tech Comes Home. We know from that that technology that was originally developed for surveillance purposes in prisons is gradually transitioning into the home and the workplace. Um, one of the probably most pertinent examples that you might have heard of is the Amazon Ring, a smart doorbell. Um, whose largest customer base is not residential homes or customers in that sense, as one might expect, but police forces around the US that purchase the visits video data taken from the doorsteps of people's homes. So the project is trying to situate a discussion on the future of technology and how we want to live with it in the spaces that are associated with deep intimacy and privacy and also, on the other hand, in this typically uh, suburban setting, a sense of anime around these topics. I'm interested in um, invoking film as spatial research, the, the technique of database cinema that's already been developed, although in a different context, and to use this to structure a se series of filmed and, and, and simulated sequences. Um, a woman, my own mother in this case, performs this discretized set of household tasks, ironing, hanging out the laundry, vacuum cleaning, these mundane, intimate scenes of daily life in a home. And then the work is leading towards this database cinema presentation in which a custom software interface hosts this database of both filmed and simulated sequences that users can sort of reorganize into a non-linear. OK, so the final project um, moves into, I just realized, am I going very quickly? All right. So the final project um, moves into similar, a similar suite of computational tools, but ones that are used in public space, in this case in the context of human rights and the climate justice. Um, so I'd like to just contextualize this project a little bit before I, I show you some of the work. So it's situated around the emergence of this, I would describe a very contemporary form of climate justice movement that started around 2015, um, bouncing off this, what people call this international agreement of the, Pl the Paris Climate Accords. Right, where everybody agreed to limit global, uh, the average global temperature from rising above 1.5 um, And because it was very, very quickly became obvious that this was not going to be reached, um, and this looming threat of, let's call it climate collapse, one group emerged called Extent Extension Rebellion, the, the green logo, um, in 2018. Um, and they specifically deployed strategies of nonviolent direct action, um, having determined that these are effective based on historical human rights movements that have used them. Um, so in 2019, there was a series of protests in which over a thousand people consented um, to be arrested through non-compliance with certain laws. Um, and because of this perception that people were willing to break the law, enough numbers were willing to break the law. Apparently the number 1,000 people getting arrested in a day is a number that's been associated with other historical movements of when change was affected. So that it got to 1,000 people were arrested in a day. And so the UK government um, changed the law um, 
to basically prevent this kind of climate protest from taking hold. And they realized that under the threat of climate collapse, being arrested, spending the night in a police cell, was no longer a deterrent for increasing um, or decreasing the number of people. So in the US context of climate activism, in, in this sort of strategy, uh, Extinction Rebellion is still the main group here. I think they're mainly operating in Washington, D.C. Um, but in the UK, the groups have had to morph into different versions. And the current one is known as Just Stop Oil, JSO. Well, they're sort of very much similar agendas. So just over a year ago, the UK government changed the law by amending what's called the Public Order Act to broaden the legal definition of what's considered serious disruption. It basically gives police almost unlimited powers to shut down any protest that is more than a minor disturbance. It's referred to as the anti-protest. And it directly connects to a decline in civil liberties in the context of climate justice, um, because the law was specifically changed to address this new form of climate activism that was emerging. And the line that was changed in the law was known as Section 12. And so Section 12 is very much a word that's in public circulation today. Um, it garnered a lot of attention internationally. But what I was interested in is um, in, in thinking about my interest in human activity recognition and their use in public space, um, I feel that there's this dichotomy open. On the one hand, you have the threat of climate collapse. And on the other hand, you have the threat, of kind of the real threat, of climate activism that's trying to prevent climate collapse. And I see these two positions as sort of two ontologies, two worldviews that could be explored through the lens of artificial intelligence um, and how it's encoded into these two perspectives. Um, I should say that they're thinking, again, about the testing grounds of technology. There are examples of activity recognition being used in public space, initially just counting crowds and observing the flow of people walking through the street. Um, so with J JSO in London, I participated in their nonviolent direct action training workshops and in, with Extinction Rebellion in Washington, D.C. Um, and during the summer of 2023, so about a year ago exactly, I embedded myself with this climate activist group in Just, Just Stop Oil in London. And with their agreement, I participated in these nonviolent direct actions while also documenting their more tactical and strategic thinking. So on the one hand, I'm situated in this project with stakes as both a citizen and also a researcher. And one of the most visible tactics that they deploy is called slow marching. It's just walking very slowly down a road in order to block it. They do this in very prominent roads in central London. And this lead, initially, slow marching is legal, right? You're blocking a road, but it's legal. And at some point, the police enact Section 12 and change the law, and it becomes illegal. And those that refuse to comply with the law are arrested. In doing this work, I've been interested in using the idea of, the, of, of ontology um, as a design tool to think through model design, uh, training data sets, and the possibilities of activity recognition in public space in a way that could contest civil rights. So ontology in computer science is a way of defining the world that the model or the algorithm understands, what's its um, epistemic boundaries, what are its competencies, how are those rules defined, how do they relate to other rules, right? what does the algorithm do, and very much what can it not do, what does it not see. Um, so as you can imagine, it's quite singular, it's rigid, it's hierarchical, um, it very much struggles with indeterminacy and these hum more humanistic entanglements. So this is the video data um, that I was capturing while I was working with JSO, and it's processed with skeletal recognition, which is an, one of the various activity recognition algorithms. 
So perhaps an immediate question one could ask when looking at something is, how would an algorithm recognize walking from slow walking? You know, one's, one's legal and done by everyone, and one is illegal. And the research is also thinking about the prospect of AI gate surveillance technology in relation to civil resistance in public space situated within the looming threat of climate collapse. So this is somebody consenting to And this perhaps a counter algorithm, we might be able to call it, sees tactics such as this, it's a grounding circle, the care practice that activists before, perform before they go onto the road and slow march. And from this alternative, this counter ontology, you could say it registers like the emotional labor and the psychological preparation that's involved in this kind of nonviolent direct action labor. Um, it takes into account, let's say, the emotional taxation of the work. And then kind of sub project that's come out of this work that I'm still somewhat trying to figure out um, is part of, so on the one hand, it's trying to tell the story of the section 12 police charges, um, the process of pleading guilty or not guilty, forcing a trial, preparing a legal defense based on the legality of the section 12 law. And right now in the UK, all of these section 12 trials are currently like packing the courts and using up lots of resources in the justice process um, as a consequence of all of the slow marching that happened a year ago in the summer of 2023. And simultaneously, the Section 12 law is actively under review and deliberation by the kind of upper, I guess you'd call it the Supreme Court, um, of whether it's truly legal and can continue. Um, so this is, I'm going to show you a video that comes from the body cam footage of a, one of the senior police officers who enacts Section 12 in real time when there's a protest taking place and sort of turns the process from something that's legal um, to illegal and then So there's two things I'll explain that come out of this video that I'm interested in. The so one is, in the process of developing the other projects and thinking about data sets and how one builds activity recognition data sets and ultimately how one might build a counter data set, um, part of that process um, engages, um, if you think about in traditional like object recognition, labeling objects, in this case, one can't just label an activity as a process of segmenting the image, understanding the space spatially in terms of its depth um, and the way movement often, you can imagine with this kind of, if you think of this as data, becoming a data set, is incredibly noisy and messy data, very unideal in, in the world of machine learning. Um, and so working with techniques that kind of will, might, might turn this into a data set and all of the footage that you've seen. And then as a, as a secondary thread to this, using this, um, let's say, like counter data analysis um, to support people who are going through these trials, preparing their defense. Because this, this video footage came from the evidence that the prosecution submitted for a trial, for an ex-section 12 trial. 
Um, so it's, oh yeah, there we are. So just move, nudge this along a bit. Basically, the process of image segmentation. Um, I'm thinking about this, and at some point, the police officer kind of enacts this Section 12 trial, and the kind of, you say, like the 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 label for this um, color coding kind of flips. You say illegal or legal to illegal, and I'm interested in. Um, you know, connecting, say, the things that they're saying in their microphones that define what, what things that they're looking at in this footage to make this decision. So that all goes up as evidence in trial. Were they saying the right things? Were they looking at the right things? Were they aware of the right things? Um, what visually was on the road? And, and the timeline as well, like when the time, even down to the seconds, when the Section 12 was put in place. And you're often arguing how much disruption was there really? Was there enough? And then this footage is sort of given to one of the groups that are developing their case for their Section 12 trial. I'm not going to let it go to the end. Oh, yeah. Okay, so just to wrap up. So for me, my approach to thinking about this critical computational design, for me, I think it's, more, it's important for the field of computational design to sort of open, it up, open itself up to more um, like situated practices, reflexive practices, um, to take up the idea of socio-technical thinking as being more foundational, and that in terms of design, trying to foster um, not only criticality, but also design pointing towards this new um, counter or algorithmic imaginary. Um, so to some extent, I think that the field of computation, and therefore the field of computational design, has a kind of debt to pay, in the sense, coming from its decades-long kind of position of neutrality, I think it has a debt to pay to, to the environment, to feminism, to anti-racism, and for me, this kind of debt can only be repaired through a more, um, a more radical approach and investment into these more interdisciplinary, um, critical concerns. But thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, questions, anyone? Ellie? Uh, thanks so much for presenting your work. It's, um, it's a really amazing set of projects. Um, I'm curious, so uh, when you're working or interacting with the world through, sometimes through a computer screen, you're working with uh, open data and APIs, sometimes it's really easy to take it at face value. Um, and you talked about the idea of situatedness, which is something that we introduced to the students here. Um, and we encourage them to research data sets and algorithms and understand who made them, why they made them. Um, but I'm curious in your own practice, how do you, uh, like what are the methods that you use in order to practice situatedness and to situate the, um, the digital content that you're working with? Um, I think so. Certainly, on the one hand, if you're look, taking a, a data set that comes from somewhere else, I think there's a set of like established practices that sounds like you would teach to um, understand where that data comes from, its limitations, who funded it, who defined it. I, I think coming from the space of critical data studies now, <clears throat> asking questions about like what's not included in it, the valid set, a way of thinking about its limitations its biases and um, so those things but I think I also take 
um, situatedness um, be a way of thinking about how to, especially thinking about maybe creating your own data set in which not all of those other concerns are there. But what does it mean to create a data set as a situated or as a counter or critical data because it, it kind of is able to take on this other form, which one can. So for instance, maybe an example might be like the one that I'm building from inside of a home, right? That sort of, it's almost, a, you could say it has an element of personal storytelling, right? It's certainly got a specific to it, someone's life. And then the other thing for me that I find as part of like a situated, is using these elements, using that element of data as like a personal story, data is situated in this alternative context, counter scientific context, national context. Um, a tactic that also can kind of situate the discourse around the data that like where we might talk about the ethics or the biases of data, uh, and also where we might want to talk about you know, future imaginaries of data and how data creates the technology we live in. How do you situate that within, within a context that those things are very rarely talked about, like a home, like a suburban context that is often associated or is not associated with these discourse or of people having some so I, um, there are some of the things that I do that I, that I try to think, for me, thinking around situated practice. Great, thanks so much. I have a, do, do, do any of, I have a follow-up unless one of the students wants to ask a question. Okay, so um, yeah, I really appreciate that, that answer and I, I have a question which will maybe sort of shift it in another direction towards sort of your future your future work. Um, and I see kind of three buckets in which your work fits. And the one is obviously this academic, you know, socio-technical, critical data studies, and it's a very kind of academic pursuit. And on the other side is human rights and the um, um, and you know presenting evidence in a court of law, almost like forensic architecture. The last project you showed, it, it sounded like some of it was going to push over into that direction. And then there's the third one, which is the policy related, when you're showing the White House documents and wanting to take your work and have an influence over how software is developed. And in that way, you would have to collaborate with scientists who, and I don't know, I mean, I'm often in meetings with uh, computer scientists who don't understand the word critical and, you know, they just, they refuse to sort of um, think of it as a field in and of itself. So I'm just curious where you see those three things coming together. I mean, I love the academic work and how it, um, you know, it has a whole conversation with a whole field, um, which you're obviously going to push forward in your book, et cetera. But whether this policy oriented and talking to scientists is something you want to pursue and have an influence. That's something, I, I guess I'm asking that question because it's somewhere we think our program um, could make a dent, um, is training um, students to be able to talk to computer scientists in a way that really will have an influence on how they do their work to get rid of some of these biases and presumptions and right the things that you're critical of. So. Yeah. Um, I think that the so you know I worked on this funded project this summer called Braid, the overarching. And that project is, I should say, it's the first experience I've had of, of working on a larger in, international grant um, with 
universities in three different countries. I think on that team, there's three computer scientists and far more people who are in the arts. So in that sense, and I would say it's like to answer the question about computer science. So I'm I'm not I'm not trained in computer science. It very much comes from arts and kind of creative coding, which is now critical. But um, and all I can say is it's really difficult. I found it it's very difficult. It's like just fundamental language difference um, and I I hesitate to sort of um, like criticize because um, even though sometimes I have, I have met scientists who sort of just really don't want to know about the ethical issues although I think it's probably getting increasingly very hard to have um, but <laughs> this is really hard Really hard. I mean, just working on this project, um, there was a point in the middle of it that I was like, "What have I got myself into?" Like, I don't. There's, you know, everyone's trained in their spaces, and no one's trained to work together. You've got, and I should say, this project, thinking about the policy, was a bunch of artists and scientists working together, and the the outcome of the project was a report that's written. And the University of Bournemouth has paid a policy, uh, what do they call it, a lobby, a lobbying company. So basically, you, it turns out you buy meetings with the government. Totally legit. So the outcome of this research gets written up into a report and is presented in person to a sort of um, policy group around technology in the UK Parliament. And so, as well as have, finding it very challenging to develop a shared sort of language and a shared set of interests between the arts and sciences just to do the project. Um, there's also a challenge of really not understanding how policy works either. And um, there are some social scientists who were not part of the main research team, but who have come in to sort of support the development of that write up, it, writing up of the report. Um, and you know, there's been discussions of like, how do you turn the data we have, which is very much qualitative, into something that's more quantitative, and sort of trying to like um, apply, after the fact, apply quantitative methods onto research that was never developed with that training or with that perspective in mind, you know? Just, it's really hard, really hard. I guess the only thing I could say from my perspective optimistic thing is that I guess encountering those real challenges does make you maybe find maybe it'll be a bit easier next time if I was to do something like this um, yeah like <laughs> but maybe I could just add one thing though something I do see that's positive is that you know not so long ago you would never have asked invited the arts to come in, people in the arts and design, to come in and give them like real research money to develop projects that's going to potentially influence policy. You know, I feel like artists have never been in that position. Um, and so now there seems to be, I notice, a lot more funding to try to bring these groups together. Yeah, but also, I would say more importantly, to recognize the value of the arts in contributing these discussions. And so um, there was in the US, there's been um, any hate National Endowment for Humanities. So they announced a very large grant to sort of start a center for the AI, for AI and the humanities to sort of um, center of excellence kind of thing. So I think that that process is ongoing to try Hey, uh, thanks for sharing all this amazing work. Uh, I'm really interested in this concept of the counter algorithm mm -hmm. and just wanted to sort of make sure I understood the, the concept. Is it um, sort of there where you presented, um, where you grab the data set and the algorithm and 
reframed it or used it in a slightly different way, is the intention there that the availability of, of this different type of data will influence the algorithm itself if it were to you know, be trained again and it'll pick up this new data set that's been produced? Or is it more in the communication of what the algorithm is doing and the visualization of it and, and, and that's the, the counter part of it is, is, is using to show how it might be used? Yeah. So I'll tell you like the way I've approached it. Um, but, you know, I see it as just a term, like, I'm sure anybody could take it in a very different direction. Um, I think there could be lots of strategies. Some of them, like, based in technology and algorithms, and some of them maybe conceptual. Um, so I, what I did with this uh, was, it was when I was looking at the, um, the labor uh, project with uh, construction site workers, and looking at the data sets and looking at the things that were sort of being valued versus being very clearly de devalued in the algorithm and coded as so. Um, and then I started looking up um, alternative ways of measuring and valuing labor and also much more progressive ways that I don't want to say are all embedded in workplaces already, but are very much like in contention and in discussion with governments around the world, sort of like almost on the cusp of maybe being, they started looking at those kind of data sets. And there's a, um, there's a sort of field of research that's called um, um, like well, well being in the workplace kind of work. Um, and there's various very precise and studied metrics over years of how one, how one measures this notion of well-being, which is A, completely subjective um, and understood to be various things. And so I, was, I started to get interested in that field and sort of how they take something that's kind of somewhat nebulous, somewhat emotional even, you could say, very subjective, and sort of apply this as a metric that could be incorporated into future workplaces. Um, so I started there, and then I sort of, and so I had that kind of idea of data sets, and then I also got much more speculative and started pulling at, let's say, much more progressive ideas in labor politics and workplaces and care practices for what those things would look like, that are very much not close to being measurable even. And so, yeah, I, it, for me, the, that project of like the unmodeled became a sort of counter data set project um, in which I just, in terms of design, would just find ways of visualizing this, these other data parameters. Um, and, you know, if you were to look at it more slowly, like some of these things really make sense and some of these things are unmeasurable, like, at least now. I mean, I imagine wellness well-being used to be considered unmeasurable. Found a way to make it so. Um, so that's sort of where I started as a counter algorithm. And for me, I started to think of it as like, this is a way to make it a design project. You're proposing something. It becomes propositional. It becomes design. But you sort of start with a counter data set. Um, I've been interested in the work of um, Yanni Lukisas for a while, and he a lot of words that are part, passed around in this space. So like some people talk about agonistic data is interesting. There's a sort of counter data approach. Um, yeah, I mean, then the other thing is like right at the end when I showed you that video of the body cam footage, which is sort of, I'm not sure where it's going to go exactly. Um, but I, I can see how that I could start to shape it as something that could be articulated as a counter algorithm. Um, but um, in the way that it sort of contests the law in the video and it could be used in an, in a, as part of evidence or as a kind of design layer of evidence that's already being used. Um, but it's sort of not figured out yet. Thank, Catherine, thanks for sharing the, 
good ideas in the project. Um, I, I personally is interested in uh, um, kind of a behavior data and the mechanism that you share as a labor or like your parents like a mechanism. Uh, but my question is, uh, this kind of a data could be used to either to be uh, analytical, right? It's like uh, see the pattern or to use to detect the intention, like to predict, to predict the intention. But in both ways, I, I, my assumption is that uh, this might be some constraint in that kind of a computational design. What I mean is, uh, uh, do we consider any method to create this sense making? For example, how, we, how can we understand or explain that kind of behavior and mechanism? Because my assumption is that they do have some like a, maybe for example, cultural difference or maybe some context that we lost if we just focus on that kind of uh, data collecting. Yeah, is there any way that we can use uh, as a complementation that to really understand or to predict the individual's intention better, like based on the computation design, yeah. Maybe I could say a bit more about that project you're talking about, and you can tell me if I don't think I'm going to answer it. But with that project, I, on the one hand, you're creating essentially large data. Based in it. one person's brain, one person's brain, and the things that kind of they do um, situation. Um, and all, what I was interested in is that is, um, and it, so I would say it doesn't really do it yet in what in terms of that sort of database of most information. Um, but I guess there's the idea of when you look at the data set of Activity recognition algorithms, the things that they're being trained on, very kind of like agnostic tasks, right? A lot of them are exercise routines, right? Like people doing yoga and people doing like very typical kind of aerobic like exercises. And the reason is, is because you can kind of completely delineate the body super simply. Um, you can see it moving exactly, very unnoisy. And so all of these algorithms tend to be trained on that type of a situation, very like context diagnostic. Um, because m most of the people that would then use that, those models are not really using them to, do, to try to identify aerobic exercise and apply to something completely different. But part of my interest in just exploring this project is like what happens when you take a data set that's very situated very personal. It's like this woman in her house doing her stuff, um, some of which might be very obvious, like ironing or whatever, in terms of like a his traditional, uh, but some of it might be more complicated. I was interested in that. Um, and then the other, for me, the context is really interesting is um, um, a lot of the discourse and prototypes that are being developed around care work. So not only in the home, but also like the labor of care outside the home, like elderly care, right? Um, child care. Um, I mean, you know, I was just at the University of Michigan, and I had colleagues that were working in a robotics lab for <coughs> care robots. And it's kind of really spectacular how advanced that is as an industry, uh, as a research space, the kind of robots that we might see in elderly care homes um, so I'm interested in like who like what, what does it mean to design a data set that might design to might design a technology that gets into the home sort of who has a say in the in the design of, on the construction of that data set sort of all the things that we've been talking about what kind of activities go in what don't go in uh, what happens if you design the data set from a non not an agnostic space but from a uh, much richer personal space, you could say noisy, 
emotionally noisy and personally noisy in some ways. Um, so, go back to your question, like the idea of you know, like predicting intention. Well, I mean, if you're asking like tech, you know, I, no, I don't know. It feels like a technical question. But, I mean, the things that I encounter that talk more, start to poke more at intention. Coming from a perspective company, the ability to recognize the space and supposedly recognize emotion. And then maybe when it comes to activity recognition, possibility of recognizing gate. You know, gate is sort of the idea that everyone has a unique gate, the way your body moves. If looked at from a very precise perspective, this is could become a, a biometric, I don't know, in there that you start to look at intentional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey. Ah. Uh, yeah. Um, I think I could trace the intention behind um, recording the body movements of your mother in her uh, space. Was that like my father is an auto mechanic, and sometimes I sit there and draw him working um, while he's working and just waiting for him. And I realized that some of these, um, I guess, occupations or professions are like getting um, obsolete, becoming obsolete, mm -hmm. and sort of, I, I guess if I could, I would record him as he fixes a car, changes oil, etc., to kind of archive, like, these are some of the jobs that used to exist when, you know, back in history when we had these cars or whatever, like, things are changing so rapidly, like, so in the future, much down the road, these can be like archival history of, I don't know, doing mundane things. <laughs> I think that's a really great project. Yeah. That's a really interesting idea, yeah, that you could be, so often we're thinking constantly of the future, whether it's a, a good future or a risky future, concerning future, but the idea that you take certain things for granted, that certain jobs are going to be lost, that sort of discourse around that. Jobs are, jobs are the right ones to go versus what do we become? Think about it. Hi. I want to uh, thank you for presenting your projects. I find it so interesting that you developed this practice around um, like the counter and criticalness is still within the logics and using the same technologies of computation. I feel like so often when we think of countering these algorithms, the first thing we think of doing is to go on the opposite end and draw really qualitative, you know, uh, understandings of the same processes, but not using the same tools to think about them. Um, but then at the same time, when I'm looking at some of the projects, I just wonder, um, the same way in which, like you said, the data is very much situated and, and that situation matters, these algorithms are also very situated and the way in which they become dangerous sometimes are the way that they are used, specifically like the financial uh, finance algorithms deciding who gets loans. I think that was the first one of the first things you presented. And later on, I just imagine like some of the data sets that you create if taken out of this very specific context that you've drawn beautifully around them, um, like the videos of the protesters, if taken out of that context, they can be used in a way that may be uh, um, counterintuitive, like countering your intentions with them. And I just wonder how you grapple with that, that after you put out your projects within your practice, that these same data sets can be used in a way, for example, with the workers, I imagine this dystopian future where like when they're uh, 
you said you want to measure like how they feel, their well-being. If their well-being reaches a critical threshold, they fire them immediately. You know, like imagination that. Like, I wonder how you think about your practice after uh, you put them out into the world. Yeah. So you do, you're asking like if if the data that I produce. Mm -hmm. um, or the designs was sort of out in the world and how would I feel about that being used in different ways? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so just very practically speaking, so the way, the way the work exists right now, um, anything that I've got as a data set that I've constructed is probably considered a very small data set, mm -hmm. considering the, real, the data sets that are out there and the trained machine learning models. Um, so I don't, I don't know if, I guess what I'm saying is like, just practically, I wouldn't be concerned about them being used in a way that I wasn't happy with, um, if they were out there. Um, and it's not that I would be against trying to construct a data set and put it out in a way that could be downloaded, um, for instance. Um, it's just that that's not been part of the project. I don't, I don't know if it's very useful to think of it as an open source project yet, uh, in the sense that of how useful that is. I think the projects to me are developed, at least so far, as projects that kind of are to question and provoke and sort of contest and begin to point towards new propositions for model design and ontology design that are grounded in the ideas from the arts and the humanities. Um, but, you know, with that said, yeah, it's, it does come up sometimes, the idea that even, um, even a, a kind of line of thinking that's come out of some kind of critical data practice, ethics in algorithms discourse, could certainly kind of be looped back and used in ways that's not very, um, in ways that might, we might say is regressive. Of course, that could totally. You know, like, I mean, I, I would say there's already that, that counter, counter criticism of, say, well-being data sets in the world of, like, well, to what extent are the, is this field really trying to challenge workers in the world and why we work and for who? It's really just making maybe the workplace a little bit better, you know? Um, is it just like, some people might mock that kind of work as, like, you know, it's just like installing a... Um, what do you call those chairs that like better for your back something you know ergonomic um, like oh is it just like a sort of amped up ergonomic chair or is it really kind of offering people something different you know and I could see how though you might I might have to engage with those sort of criticisms as well yeah anyone else Yeah, my, my question is probably naive, but um, when, you, when in your second project you capture the, um, the human behavior uh, and collect those data, I wonder, uh, did you use the, well, you just set up multiple cameras or there are wearable devices? Yeah, it's based on a mocap suit. Mm -hmm. It's like you wear a suit. Yeah. Buy them. You wear a suit as embedded in it, and it's the one that goes around your head. They ha it has a pair of gloves. They have every sensor and every knuckle, so you can see. And that's how I created the, that sort of deep tech animation, mocap animation. Same suit that's um, used in like develop animation. Or in the game, you know, for characters in the game. That's what I use. But maybe just for instance, you there are examples of using these animations as 3D um, activity rationale. You could convert what I did into a 3D recognition. Skeletal 3D skeleton. 
Whereas, you know, when, with 2D recognition, you're just asking the camera to, the algorithm to identify the body. And this could be a 3D version. So there's the potential to develop it like that. But it's Anyone else, sir? I think even if we should probably wrap up soon. Okay, probably it. Yeah, thank you so much, Catherine. That was really great.